My name is Iñaki Villar and I'm going to speak about Espresso. Uh, how many developer, Android developers we have in the room? Please raise your hand. And how many of you are working with Espresso? Wow, perfect. Excellent. So, uh, first of all, uh, this talk is, uh, you know, Espresso, if you are working, so we have the view matters, but today, we are not going to talk about uh, the basics of Espresso. This talk is going to be a little bit more advanced, so let's check the, what's the basic structure of Espresso and some tips to work. Why? Because now in my current company, in Agoda, we have replaced the, the previous framework, so it's Appium, I remember, and now we have covered 60% of manual testing. So that's mean that when we are going to release a new version, we are not doing manual testing. So QA is not doing the manual testing in 60%. So we are not, uh, we don't have uh, resources trying to, to, to do the testing. So, and it's like a, like a love story, right? Because when you start working with Espresso, everything is fine, everything is nice, right? You have like a feeling in the stomach, so the butterflies, whatever. But after two tests, so after two days and some stuff, you hate it, right? <laughs> That's life. Okay, uh, let's talk first of all about uh, the structure and what's the, what's the insights of, of Espresso. Uh, the first concept is talk about instrumentation, right? The Android API testing provides hooks in the application component and the life cycle of the, of the application. What's mean? It's a key concept. This is from the API 1 in Android. And to understand what it is, for example, if you have your device and the user goes back in your activity, what happened? The activity finished, right? So internally, you know that the method on the destroy is called. But who is calling this method? You? No. It's the system. You don't have access to these methods. So, well, obviously you can type on destroy in your code, but it's not the case. So that's the instrumentation. You have access to these internal calls from the system to start or destroy an activity as you are in a real application. From the last version of the, or the last version since one year, two years almost, we have the ATCL. That's the acronym for Android Testing Support Library. And we have a new improved instrumentation runner, right? The base is the monitoring instrumentation. This monitoring is uh, it's having advanced features for the, for the Android uh, instrumentation. I mean, for example, you don't have to wait until the view is rendered on the, on the screen. So it's not, nothing to do with the space. So it's with the monitoring instrumentation. Uh, at the end, we are adding in our code in the build gradle the Android JUnit runner, right? But before is the monitoring. So one of the cool thing is that before the application is, well, before the activity is started, I mean, you have the application on create. After that, you are calling the instrumentation start. So that's mean that always you know that you are you have an application in a sane state. So it's important, right? It's maybe some that for us uh, as developers, so we are working with Express is not very clear, but it's cool to have something that is behind you controlling everything for you. The instrumentation, the instrumentation or the Android J unit runner, in this case, is having a, a lot of custom uh, arguments, runner arguments. And that's mean that we can start the testing not always with the Gradle plugin. Remember that when you want to start your Espresso test, you have to click and you are executing two tasks. Assemble plus the test, connected automation, automation test. But I don't know, so imagine that I'm testing and I don't want to repeat the compilation time because until now, today, for example, we don't have any feature of instant run in, in Espresso. And it's uh, very sad, but I hope that in the future we can have the same features like in the normal application because you are spending a lot of time. So, which arguments we have in the instrumentation? That there are a lot, but for me, let's, let's take some, some importance. So, uh, we have the package and class. That means that we can run only one test uh, included in, in, in a class, in a package. The way that we want to do it is maybe with ADB shell AM 
and then we can run the, the test. That's mean that if I want to repeat my test, I don't have to, to compile. Another argument, uh, it's the debug. It's cool because we can attach the debugger into the test, so and it's fast. And the annotation and coverage. Remember that we have some custom annotations of provided by the ATCL, like a small, large test. Maybe we can run only this test with, with the annotation and the coverage. One, uh, these two, so they're not very known, but I, we are using a lot of them, and it's the sharding. The sharding is the ability to split the test. So imagine that you have 50 tests and two devices. With shard, you can split the, the number of tests per each device. It's faster, right? Actually, we are working with agents in Team City for four devices, so 400 tests, and we are splitting with sharding the, the it's very easy. You have to specify the num of shards that you want. Maybe I want seven shards because I have seven devices, and then the shard index that you want to execute. So uh, shard seven, uh, num shard seven, shard index two, for example, and you are executing only the shard in number, number two into the device that you have selected. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much the, the story with the uh, Android unit runner. Well, uh, actually, we are using all these this unit runner because before in the past, I remember the name of the Google instrumentation runner, test instrumentation runner. Now it's uh, completely deprecated. So think about these this runners. OK. Now we know a little bit what's the instrumentation. Uh, the next step is to know what's happened uh, in the project because Espresso is a dependency in our project, but it's a library. Let's take a look uh, how to see the, the, what's the internals. If we see what's the basic method, the view interaction on view, we can see the code that we are calling the base class. This is, uh, belongs to the dependency injection framework that uh, it's using Espresso to provide all the dependencies. I think it's a good practice uh, for a project. Uh, I, when I start a new project, not from scratch, you know, uh, I join a new company, I think it's a good practice to understand how's going in the project, to analyze the graph of the dependency injection framework, because you can have a good picture about what's the internal. Internally, the, the first component, the, the base component, is the base layer component. And we have two modules, two main modules, the base layer module and the UI control module. The dependencies provided in the base layer module are this, so some of them are very common in our case. Uh, for example, the context, the looper, the recycle, not the recycle view, the recycle of the, of, uh, of the SSQ. And let's talk about a little bit, for example, the activity lifecycle monitor. This is this activity lifecycle monitor. It's from the instrumentation runner. It's not from Espresso. And allow you to query the state of the activity under test. Okay? I trigger my activity, maybe some resume, maybe it's a stop it, maybe it's some pause, and I can and I can say I can check the state of the activity. The syntax pool monitor is uh, well it's an interface that allows to uh, allows to, to know what's the state of the queue of the syntax in the in the application. And this uh, syntax pool monitor is, sell, is telling you that if the queue is idle or there are some executing or pending execution or task. The activity route lister, as you know, is an interface to provide access to all the views in the user interface, right? When we are doing this on view, matter, whatever, this, this is the dependency that is allowing to us to do that. Failure handler is an interface to, to listen to the errors that is happening in the runtime. And finally, the event injector is one interface with the, that allows to select the proper strategy to inject the events in the, in the, in the code. The other module is the UI controller module, and it's providing the UI controller dependency that is a base level user interface component that provides uh, or allow you to build actions like on click, scroll, whatever, and handles all the synchronized problems that we, we can have. OK, after now, what's the dependencies that we have in every module? Uh, again, so I think that is, is very important. Don't, 
I think in other projects, uh, the developers include all the dependencies in the base in the in the base application object, and it's not a good practice. But in this case, it's very well right, and you can see you can learn how to is structure the, the code of Espresso. So after see the dependencies, we we the next step is to know where are injecting these dependencies, right? So obviously we have the failure handler holder that we are repeating, the activity root lister, and the idling resource registry. Uh, idling resource is a term very popular in, in Espresso is to work with background tasks and later we are going to, to see more about this class. And finally we have the view interaction component that is a component at the same time it's providing a, a module, the view interaction module. So remember that when you are trying to find a view in the user interface you are creating a view interaction okay and that's where all the magic happens behind right and here we are providing the matcher roots the dependencies the matchers all this stuff so in a uh, in summary sum up uh, i want to say that uh, espresso is adding by one hand the uh, instrumentation well espresso we are with espresso we are working with the android unit runner included in the atcl android testing support library and the other hand, so Express is using a dependency injection framework. We are using a base layer component providing two main modules, the base layer module and the UI controller module. OK? So uh, now the next, the next point is talk about synchronization. And it's very important because one of the key features of Espresso is the synchronization, right? Uh, when you are trying to do an on view on the, on the, on the code, you know that the view, this view that you are matching, trying to match, is on the screen. So you don't have to take care about these things. Uh, remember, years ago, or uh, with other frameworks, or uh, Robotium, trying to do a uh, wait until idle, uh, or even worse, trying to do a thread sleep, trying to wait until the view is rendered. So that's the magic of Espresso, right? So and I think that is a, a cool thing. But sadly, that's not the perfect wall, and we are not using Espresso in do a simple on view, uh, doing an assertion, right? We are using different libraries, architectures, or I don't know, approach, and we are using threads. We are using Asyntask, we are using, I don't know, RxJava, service, whatever. And in this, in this part, we are going to see more, more parts about that. So, uh, how it works uh, internally when we are trying to do a, a click, uh, perform a click of view interaction, right? You have the view on the screen and you want to do a click. Okay, first of all, in our main activity test, we are typing the, the, the click, performing the click, and we are going to the view actions. The view actions is generating a general click action. Why general? Because maybe you want to do, I don't know, so it's not a single tab. Maybe you want to do a double click, you want to do a, I don't know, so click on the top left on the screen, whatever. That's the, that's the class that belongs to everything about the clicks action. Then we are going to the tapper and we are sending an event, but here with the UI controller. Oh, important. Here we are showing that we are using the UI controller. And finally, in the motion events class, we are injecting the, the, the motion event that in this, clay, in this case, it's only a, a click. Okay, so it's a little bit hard, right? Follow the, follow the track. And what's the, the point of this is to use the UI controller. As we saw before, the UI controller is the key of everything when we try to do something, right? Because again, uh, I load my activity, I don't know what's happening behind, and maybe I have to wait. Who is responsible to this wait, to this idle state? The UI controller. And how works the UI controller? Well, maybe it's a little bit difficult, but I think that it's important that we have to understand how it works, okay? So, first of all, I want to inject a, inject a, a click in the screen, right? So the first thing is looping the main thread until it's idle. Okay, we are working on the main thread because we are doing operations on the user interface. So we have to wait or we have to know when we want to run this command on view because maybe the screen is not ready. 
this loop main thread until idle is uh, taking different states of different monitors, right? You have three main, uh, you have two, two, two main groups. One is the syntax and the other is the idling, so the custom idling resource. So Espresso at the beginning is doing that. Uh, is idle the queue of a syntax? Because Espresso has one queue of message of a syntax. See, uh, it's ready? No. So I want to send a signal with a syntax to say that loop until this message is, is, is okay. The same for the, uh, for the idling resources. Okay, but why a syntax? Well, a syntax is a, I know that well, before in the talk of Enrique, we are living in 2016, all the people is not using a syntax, but internally Android use a lot of a syntax, right? When you are typing something in an edit text in Android, when you type one character, it's sending one a syntax. Okay, so the action to write is in a syntax, so Android internally is using. For this reason, we need a queue of a syntax to know what's happening behind. How Espresso populate this queue of a syntax? By reflection. <laughs> At the beginning of the, when we're instantiating the syntax pool monitor that later we are going to see, is getting all the syntax pending on the, on the message queue and creating a, a creating call, uh, thread pool. The same for the idling resource, okay? Uh, you know that you can create your customs idling resource. So uh, we are asking, this idling resource is idle? No, so I send a signal and say loop in the message queue until this idling resource is idle. So this is a loop, of course, uh, and it's happening until two factors, until everything is idle or until we reach the limit of the timeout defined by the espresso, okay? What happened after? Well, when we know that everything is, is not pending, so we have cleared the, the main thread, we can send or click to the main thread. But we are not, we are not, sending, uh, we are not sending that directly to the, to the main thread. We are sending a signal with a flag saying that I want to execute this click event. And then we are calling again the loop until waiting for Espresso to execute this to execute this signal. So it's quite uh, seems to be a little bit complex, but it's quite easy. So I want to execute something, I want to do a on click. First of all, I have to clean the queue. Loop until the uh, the, the queue is clean. After that, send a message saying that I want to do a click and wait until the click is done. Okay, more or less. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's quite simple. And the code, it's uh, if you have forgot, uh, forgotten about the concurrency in Java, so here there's a lot of, of concurrency in Java. It's, it's quite awesome in this case. Well, let's see the, the code of, of the loop main thread until idle. In this case, I, I just removed some parts because they're not important, but this is the real implementation of the, of the code. Uh, first of all, so what we are saying that is the syntax pool monitor is idle. So if it's not idle, we are we are calling to the notify when it's idle. The same for the all resources idle. So if we see the code here. Oh, okay. If we see the, the code here, we have a, a loop until all the conditions are done, and meanwhile we are doing and doing everything everything the same. Okay, so. What is uh, the, the syntax pool monitor? So we have not only one, we have two, a syntax pool monitor in the code. Uh, here is there, so why we have two? Because there is a different implementation of the syntax between the compact version and the normal version, the first version of the, of the Android. So actually we have two, a syntax pool monitor for, for check what happened with the syntax. The implementation of the syntax pool monitor of course, we have some concepts like uh, an atomic integer to, to know what's happening and a thread pool executor. This thread pool is used by Espresso using the reflection to populate the pending casintas that you have in the queue on the main loop. Okay, and how works the, this definition of is idle? So quite easy, right? We have to, to check if the queue is empty for the pool 
and then if not, we can define we can define uh, an interface called uh, monitor or notify when it's idle the resource, and it's quite 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 easy. So this approach is uh, is used by the again for the syntax of the computer syntax. But I remember uh, one year ago I have seen some developers using this this approach to handle his own uh, executor service. For example, you have your, your executor service, so you are doing the same approach. You are creating an asyntask pool monitor, but as the asyntask is only a pool that is getting by reflection, you can use your own executor service, and you can do the same. The, maybe the, the bad thing of this is that you are having a little bit complexity, and not only, not only works with your our custom implementation. Okay, the other, the other check that we are doing in the loop main until is idle is the idling resource registry. Remember, when you are using one idling resource at the beginning of the code in Espresso, the method, whatever, you are using the register and then the unregister. So now I understand this when the hip hop concert, right, is happening. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, how is just the implementation? The how Espresso checks is all the resources is idle. Okay, uh, that's the official way how Espresso is working. So when you are trying to do an unview or when you are trying to do a, an unclick, first of all we are checking the syntax pool monitor for the syntax, syntax pool monitor for the compatible syntax, and the idle resource. After that, we are we are clicking. We are doing the sending the the event of clicking. So, but again. That's the perfect ball with on view. How, uh, how we can handle with our code? We have uh, an architecture, for example, that we are using a, a pull executor to execute, or I don't know, or network calls, for example. How we can handle this? Uh, again, you can implement your idling resource, for example. You can do whatever you want. But I think that this, this is a good trick. I have seen the other day. And Waba, the application Waba, uh, has one class called the uh, wrapping executor service and is trying to wrap uh, with a delegate one executor service and it's quite interesting because you have this wrap task uh, you have a wrap task that means that if you uh, you have a delegate executor service and then when you are trying to execute the task you can wrap this task and call the abstract method on the class so it's quite interesting because that means that you can decorate the executor service of your class is uh, private in 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 Guava, but nobody, no, you can copy the code, and you can implement this abstract class in your in your project, right? So that means that I can create an idling resource executor service extending from the Guava wrapping executor service that I copied before in my code. So and how it works? Quite uh, simple. So I have two params, the executor service that previously maybe I can populate by DI again, and the handling idle resource that, uh, to help with, to know where is idle the, the system. And that's it. In the moment that something is called in the executor service, you want to execute the, the runnable, you know that you can wrap this call and do the magic. So, and the magic is here. So before, I incrementing my idling resource, and when it's finished, I decrementing. And now I know that the system is idle. So, and that means that you can use your code. So, because there are different approaches with the architecture, and you can use a thread pool executor, your own thread pool executor in, in Express on this way, and it works very well. Okay, uh, another another part. Maybe you are working with RX Java. No, you are not doing with a uh, thread pool executor manually, and you are relying in, in RX Java. So here we have maybe different options, and I have seen in the past at Expresso some options that you are trying to wrap the observables, and I don't think that it's work because maybe you want to you you have a hot observable and you want to to know what happened, not only ending on the own complete. Okay, so the solution is create a Java scheduler hook that's provided by the framework as well. So that means that we can create a scheduler hook and the idea is do the same as the executor service. So before the action is executed, I want to increment my, my, my atomic 
counter, and then I want to decrement. So here I want to, in my definition, I'm passing as well a country item resource, the instance, and then I'm creating a custom scheduler. Okay, this custom scheduler, after all, so it should be the same. You have to create a new worker, of, of course, but you are doing the same magic. That means that every time that you are executing something in Linux Java, you are scheduling an action, you have the increment and the decrement, and it works. That's the solution that we are using actually in Agoda because we have a lot of Linux Java, sadly, but it's working very well. So, and you don't have to take care about anything about this. So, and it's the same, the same approach. So, wrap something like the executor service of Java, but in this case, wrap the scheduler, create a new worker, and increment, decrement, increment, decrement. Okay, and how finally I have to put that? Well, at the beginning, you have, it's, well, it's deprecated, but let's see what's happening, I don't know, honestly, in edX Java 2, what's the, what will be the solution, but actually, we can, uh, register a custom hook at the beginning of the project. So that's mean uh, uh, when you are executing something in Express in Rx Java, you are handling on this way. Okay. And well, the next step is to know well, uh, Rx Java uh, executor service. Now maybe you don't have a very complex uh, application and you are only doing calls with OK HTTP. And there is a cool library that it was released this year as well. And you can do the same. So this library provides you the, the way to wait until the call is done, right? I do a call, I have a dispatcher, and I want to, to call. Very easy, right? Because we have the resource, we are registering the resource, and that's it. Espresso, execute the action when the call is finished. Internally, uh, if you see the code, it's quite simple. So we have a dispatcher from OK HTTP as well. And uh, you know that they, uh, they have an idle callback in the new implementation of the OK HTTP 3. And that's how it's working, right? In the moment that the, internally the dispatcher is finishing the call, is calling the idle callback, and that's it. So it's another solution. And that's it. So all the complexity of the threading in Android can be handled by I think, these three use cases. Uh, Sorry, I forgot to mention one thing about the, this, this, this case, and is that this solution doesn't cover the devones operators like delay. No, delay, no, oh, what's, yeah, delay, delay. But uh, in our case, it's not important because so it's something more about the user interface that we are using. Okay. So after the threading synchronization with Espresso, we have to talk about rules. Uh, as you know, if you are working with Espresso, you are using activity test rules, right? Uh, in the previous instrumentation, remember, you have to use the activity instrumentation test case to extending from this class. It was a mess. Now it's much easier, so we have to define this rule, activity test rule, the class that we want to handle, it, and that's it. So in the moment that we are running our test, we know that the class main is in the, on the screen. This, cli this class provides some methods, like the before activity launch, so some, some cases that we want to do some operations, right? Imagine that I want to lock something and before the activity is launched, and you can overwrite, and you can do this, this, this stuff. Uh, Besides, we have the intent test rule as well. Activity test rule, intent test rule. This is, in, this is an extension from Espresso trying to isolate the logic with other applications or other activities, right? If I'm testing, for example, one phone that, one phone, one application that when I click in one button is triggering the dialer phone or a phone. I don't want to test this application because it's something about the system. I want to test the intent send, right? That's the reason of the intent extension. So if we see the implementation, it's quite simple. So it's extending from the activity test rule and then we are only overriding two methods and doing the tools of 
in it the, the interns and releasing the, the interns. So one optimization that we did in, in, in the company is merge the both both activities or both test rules and create or custom test rule and that's mean that well so why if I want to extend something generic I have to use intent or activity test rule. So if you create that you can obviously Override the, the values and do the same magic. The third param in the activity test rule is if the application is the, if the screen if touch. So if it's touch, of course, right? Well, and at least for us, 99% of the of the cases, you always have to do an interaction with the user interface, right? So you can override these params, and that's 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 it. That's the first trick related with uh, with activity test rules, but uh, the activity test rule what is so it's uh, if you are checking the code uh, the extension on the extension at the end you finish on the test rule. It's a concept not for Espresso, it's for JUnit, right? So if you have working with JUnit, it's a very common concept. It's only a modification how you are testing the how you are executing the test. Let's see examples. So, a good activity, a good, uh, activity test rule is extending from UI thread rule. And this UI thread rule, it's only an extension that we are overriding the UI thread statement to know that it's in the main, in the main thread, right? So we are using a test rule, but we are overriding the, the, the value. How works for the activity, for example, and a statement. The statement is the thing that we are uh, running in the in the J unit in the J unit rule. So in this case, it's, you maybe you can understand perfectly. So the M base uh, represents the, the the test, okay, the test that we want to execute, right? What is doing the activity statement before the M base evaluate? That's the the thing of J unit. We are launching the activity. And finally, we are finishing the activity. So for my test in my application, first of all, I launch the activity, execute the test, and finally, I finish the activity. That's the statement of the Espresso. Okay? So we are using a concepts from the JUnit, from the, from the testing. It's not uh, black magic behind the, 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 the test rules. So. And of course, we can create our custom rules, right? So in this case, I'm creating a new one that is trace, trace test rule. And uh, before the evaluation of the test, I want to trace some metrics. And when it's finished, I want to trace the, I want to, to report as well how I define my test rule. Trace test rule and defining this, this with the context in this case. So that means that we can create our own test rules. So it's something about JUnit, it's not about, about Espresso. Okay, another class from JUnit important is the Test Watcher. It's an abstract class that try to um, try, track all the steps in a watcher. So that means that you have a whole information about what's happening when you are trying to run a test. That's the implementation of the test watcher. So we can see that uh, before we are starting, then we are calling the success method. If there are errors, we are calling the errors. So that means that maybe it's very interesting in, in Espresso, <laughs> in Espresso that uh, we can create our own test watcher. Imagine that I want to create a test watcher, a test rule, that when I have one problem in my test, I want to take a screenshot. Why I have to do the, this in the test? I can create a test watcher and overwrite the fail method and take the screenshot with a UI automator. That means that you always are taking screenshots of your errors. Okay? <clears throat> but of course, you can overwrite other methods if you want to do a screenshot at the beginning or if the well, if you want to trust whatever so again test watcher implementation abstract class from uh, test rule and we can overwrite the life cycle of the test the next concept in the rules is the rule chain the rule chain it's only a sequence on how a sequence of test rules are executed the Java doc of the test rule is quite simple. So we have a rule chain, and we have to define uh, outer rule and inner rules, 
right? So that means that we can uh, combine different test rules in one. If we see the output of this this rule chain, we the, the the answer is this. So first we are executing the other rule, then start in the middle, start in the inner, finishing the the inner rule, so the third one, and finishing the the middle rule. Finally, we are finishing the outer rule. Okay, let's recap all the things about uh, rules in one thing. Okay, first of all, we have seen that we have the custom activity test rule. There is a merge of activity test rule and intent test rule because we don't want to use different uh, test rules. Then uh, we have seen, well, at the end, we have seen that the rule chain. So this rule chain can be used in this way. I have a failed test, remember? When I try to execute one test, uh, it's failing, I want to take on a screenshot, and then I have my activity rule. So that means that for every test in this test rule, in this rule chain, I'm taking on a screenshot of the activity test rule. So, and that works, and I have covered my problems in my test. But it's not only the only thing, because we can combine more activities, more more test rules in the same rule chain. And remember that the trace one that we define at the beginning, creating our own test rule. So the same here, we are composing the rule chain with the failed test, the activity test rule, and finally the, the, the trace test rule. So we are using this approach, and it's quite interesting because uh, when you have maybe an application with, I don't know, with 50 features or a lot of activities you can combine. So, and you are want you want to to see some common cases in all the tests. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, with the rules, I want to to say about this library. It's called uh, Android Test Rules. It's from Shazam, and you can define custom test rules to ignore tests. Right. So, imagine that the typical thing that in this example that is provided by by the repository. I don't want to test one test or to execute one test if it's an emotion. Okay, uh, you can do that with, with this library. But the most important, so it, you are using uh, the definition one test rule. But if, for example, if you are working with A B testing and you want to cover some case with Espresso, you can use this test rule to say that execute only this test if it's A or if it's B, whatever. The same for the, if you are, for example, we are working now with the trunk approach, so always we are committing to develop, and we are working with features, right? So some features has to run the test, other features doesn't have to, to run the, the UI test. We are using this library to avoid to, to use that. Okay. Okay, uh, and finally, we have to talk about <laughs> about permissions, that is very common to talk about permissions in, in Espresso because, uh, well, actually, um, you have to take a decision, right, if you want to cover or don't cover the, the, the permission. That's one of the solutions implemented by Google in this case. So it's in the repository of the bl blueprint, and it's how it's handling. So before, you are executing your test, you are sending the PM grant permission message. Okay. Uh, I think that works well. So I think that if you have a small test, it can work. But in our case, we are using another implementation that is uh, because we are doing the assumption of all the permissions are granted in our test because we are using, uh, we are testing the regression, the full path of the application. We are not testing one isolated user interface because we are doing this, this, this approach. So quite easy, in Gradle, you hook the, the CAT, so the task to execute the test and create another task that's uh, grant the permissions. You have a bash file in your project and you are granting all the per all the permissions required by the by the phone, and well, if you are executing this this test in uh, five or four, there is no problem. It's an um, error message in the in the in the log, but that's it. It's not much. So that's the the point with the permission. So I mean that it's quite simple. So we don't have to think a lot. Again, so if you are testing the what happens if the user accepts 
or not accept the permission, yes, you can you can test uh, for your, it's up to you. But if you are testing on other things, like the payment process, so the payment process is not involved with the permissions, so you have to do that. And, well, we are most finishing, so I want to say that this, this, this talk is uh, in our work as well in Nagoda, so we, are, we have the inspiration of these cool libraries, of course, the ATCL, uh, Spoon, uh, I'm a very big fan of Spoon, of Fork, that's another cool library that you have to take in, uh, in account. Uh, Test Butler, that's from LinkedIn as well, it's new and it's very interesting. Uh, Burst and Ad Expresso and Android Test Rules. And again, so if you are interested in, in testing as well, and other guys that for me are inspiration all the time in the, in the test are these people. And well, I think that here we can develop another framework with all, the, all these people. So, and well, thank you, thank you very much. And before finish, uh, well, that's my Twitter and my Google Plus. Uh, that's my the company that we're working. I'm Google developer as expert as well. But uh, in Agoda, we are looking for developers of Android, iOS, and API. Uh, we are based in Thailand. So if you want to know more about how is the life in in Thailand. Don't be shy, and we can speak, and well, it's an amazing adventure. So thank you very much, and if you have questions. <laughs> questions about Thailand after, please. <laughs> uh, some questions about espresso? Thank you very much for a great presentation. I was waiting a uh, very long time for such a uh, deep dive into espresso details. Uh, I'm curious, uh, did you find out uh, any problems uh, while testing uh, integration with Snackbar from support library? Of course, of course. Well, the, the question is if I have problems with a Snackbar, all the things related with a Snackbar, toast, dialog, it's uh, problematic. Let's be diplomatic, right? So it's problematic. Well, uh, with progress, progress Bar, for example, in our flavor of instrumentation of Android, we are overriding the Progress Bar and using a custom view in this case. Yeah, that's one of problems. Yeah, that's it, overriding the animation values for the internal parts. But even Google is not answering, <laughs> you know, with saying that, hey, you have to test on this way, the, uh, the snack bar. But again, so for example, with the progress bar, we override custom values of the progress bar in our instrumentation flavor. Yeah, we are just turning uh, off the animations. So. Yeah, but uh, still, so uh, still, if you are disabling the animations, you have some, some problems because yeah, uh, exactly. there's some black magic behind the, the things. So. Okay, thanks again. Thank you. I have two questions. One is very important, the other one not so much. I can start with the not so important. Okay. But you mentioned Appium before. What's your opinion of Appium versus the uh, Espresso and Native Test? Well, the main difference is Appium, for, in my opinion, is thought by QA department. So it's thought by people that they don't know about the, the code. And Espresso is targeted to the developers that they have a huge knowledge of the base code. And they think that the instrumentation, the UI testing, is important. So it's not the first time that, not the first company, that I start working with Espresso after the company left Appium. So I think that it's like a, mm, I don't know, so QA department can work with, with Opium very well, but at some moment you have to speak with the developers, you have to speak, imagine the, some complex situations like A-B a -B testing, so you need to have the knowledge about the code to implement uh, some tests, right? With Espresso, with the dependency injection, activating or disactivating the values of the A-B testing or the feature development branch. One of the problems I've seen with Appium is that it seems that it's, uh, you know, they don't always support the last version of Android. And you well, they're not official, right? So maybe they're a little bit behind, but they have to say that, well, it's a good product. And I remember that there are one guy from Appium in the conference as well. So I think it's a very good product. Okay, and then the, the important question is, do you really use camel case convention? Because I saw it in some code. Uh, yeah, of course. Why? <laughs> that's the problem with that. So there are code of, of a lot of parts. So I mean, that's the, 
code from Guava, from Android framework. So if you want to discuss something about code convention, so <laughs> we can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I, I imagine that you upload. Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, yes, yes. The, the slice uh, has been uploaded, but again, the most important. So, uh, this code is uh, from Guava, for example. Uh, you have examples of the library of Jake Wharton. Yeah, I mean the so, wrappers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I can upload. Yeah, of course, we are going to upload. But uh, the 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 executor service is from from Guava, from the Guava library. So, cool. It's cool. Thank you.